Hallelujah, Lord. We give all glory and all honor to God, our Father, to Jesus Christ, our Savior, to the blessed Holy Spirit, who is indeed the one that seals us until the day of redemption. We give glory and honor to God for each and every one of you and for your presence here today. And as we continue in our pursuit of exploring the first thing of God, we want to continue with follow-up of our Sunday School lesson that I'm going to read from Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter, just to give you a background reading. But for background, we would love for you to read Exodus, the 12th chapter. Actually, the 11th and the 12th chapter would be good reading. And then, after you read Exodus, the 12th chapter, follow it up with Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 8, and 1 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 6 through 8, and then 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 34. But for our focus today, since we have so adequately read from Exodus 12 and Deuteronomy, I want to read for your hearing from Exodus 12, beginning at the last sentence of the 11th verse down through the 14th verse, and then look at 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 23b through 25. You got to say amen. Amen. And it reads like this if we put them together. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, hallelujah, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generation. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. And in 1 Corinthians 11, it tells the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And for a subject today, we want to talk about from Passover to communion. From Passover to communion. Let's pray. Father God, once again we humble ourselves before you as we stand behind this sacred desk. We don't take it lightly, God, but we honor you and give you glory that you and you alone are due. But Master, we come recognizing that we've got shortcomings of our own. And we need you, dear Heavenly Father, to search us and try us. Plow up the foul ground of our hearts. Remove every impurity, dear Heavenly Father. Creating us clean hearts and renew within us right spirits. Father, I don't have any wisdom, knowledge, or understanding of my own, so I, I need you to pour it out, dear God. I need you to move Mary and Critter out of the way and let Jesus Christ be the preacher of this moment. And, and Father, I need a fresh anointing to fall 
from on high. So Spirit of the Living God fall fresh. Spirit of the Living God fall fresh. Break them, melt them, all men feel men. Then, oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, oh God, my strength and my redeemer. We bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, my mama, my mama, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. We're looking at Exodus, the 12th chapter, and we're talking about the topic from Passover to communion. Last Sunday we celebrated communion, and today our Sunday school lesson was on the Passover. Now we realize that God never does anything without a purpose, nor a plan. And if we read Deuteronomy 16, which Brother Domino read so adequately in our hearing this morning, uh, we find that it encapsulates the Passover feast instructions as a reminder of what God did in Egypt. In that 16th chapter of Deuteronomy, uh, verse 3, it, it, it states, um, let, 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 me, let me read it for you. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction that you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And in verse 14 of our text, God specifically told the Israelites, that's in the 12th chapter of Exodus, verse 14, he said, so this shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generation. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. And so he declared that they needed to remember what he had done on their behalf. So just like we need to remember how God freed our people from slavery and, and now has allowed us to experience certain kinds of freedom, God wanted them to remember as well. You know, we as humans are so forgetful. That is the reason there is a great divide among the generations. That is, we've got all kinds of generational gaps. So, you know, those who have been there and done that and, and got the t-shirts and got the plaques on the wall and, 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 and what are they doing? Uh, they're, they're condemning those who are struggling with the same issues that, that the older generations went through. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing at brother. <laughs> you understand what, what's going on. In reality, what should be happening is that they should be comforting them with the same comfort with which they were comforted. But, but we have to learn how to remember. We have to learn how to get lessons from the past and not allow ourselves to be so forgetful about what God has done um, for us once we've gone through a particular situation. Now, when studying scripture, there is a very valuable principle called the law of first mention. Usually when God introduces a concept, the first thing he mentions is the place that gives us the best insight as to his intention. Uh, another study tool that is good to use along with first mention is something called types and shadows. That is, an element found in the Old Testament prefigures one in the New Testament. One considers a type sort of as a pattern of things to come and a, a shadow as a, a reflection or a silhouette of that thing. The first mention of the Passover is found in our Sunday school lesson today in Exodus 12. However, the setting for this event actually 
actually takes place in Exodus 11. In, in, in Exodus 11, Pharaoh and Moses had gone back and forth, back and forth, concerning the release of God's people from bondage. Now, every time Moses would say, let my people go, and, 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 and Pharaoh's heart would harden, and, and then there would begin to be uh, uh, plagues upon plagues. But actually, the original request was for the people of Israel just to go into the wilderness that they may serve the Lord. They just wanted to go and have a special worship service away from their land of bondage, out into the wilderness that they could serve the Lord. But uh, it is interesting how arrogant the enemy can get when he thinks you've got, he's got you over a battle. Oh, he gets all puffed up and thinks that he's really won a battle. Huh? And, 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 and the thing about it is, as always, God has a purpose and God has a plan. And, and God knows that Pharaoh's heart would be so hard that he would multiply his signs and wonders against Egypt. And not only against Egypt, but also against all of Egypt's gods in order to bring the children of Israel out of bondage completely and by great judgment. At one point between the sixth and the seventh plague, there, there, there were ten plagues, and, and between the sixth and the seventh, God declared to Pharaoh, he says, Indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And yet, you exalt yourself against my people, in that you will not let them go. Just for a side note, uh, uh, you see how God told Pharaoh he raised him up? That's the same thing that is true with all of the, the, the heads of governments and the various different nations uh, over in, in, in Romans, the 13th chapter. God tells us that he's the one that puts government in place. And, and so we've got to be careful about how critical we are about the people that are in government positions because what happens is when uh, God has done it, God has a purpose and God has a plan. And as he executes that plan, we will be able to see his purpose come uh, to pass. Uh, and so here with the, the Egyptians, after a few more plagues, we come to the Passover. So that's why today I want to talk to you just for a few minutes how we got from Passover to communion. Praise be to God for being the great neutralizer of the enemy forces. The scripture says it a little better than I could ever express it, so permit me to step through this 12th chapter of Exodus. If you got it, we're going to try to walk through it and see what are some points that we might want to remember. Uh, the first thing that about the Passover is that's the Lord's Passover. In, in, in uh, the 11th verse, oh, praise be to God. In the 11th verse, it says, it is the Lord's Passover. And, and, and because it is the Lord's Passover, uh, we want to be able to give him the glory and give him the honor and give him the praise that he and he alone is due. Now, 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 look, look, look what um, he says. He wants us to re remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. He don't want us to forget about the kinds of things that he has done on our behalf. He wants us to remember. So for the Passover, what it included was the lamb, the lamb's blood, the unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. Now, to get from Passover to communion, it starts with the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. In Exodus 13 and Deuteronomy, 
we see the people were instructed to remove all leaven from among them. We know, we know what leaven is uh, in, in today's uh, society. We actually call it yeast. You know, and use it to, to make bread. And have, have any of you ever made bread from scratch with the yeast? And, and when you put it in there, <laughs> and if you let it sit for a while, all of the sun it just rise. And, <laughs> if you let, and then you got to kind of pop it back down so it, and it rises again. Now, if you put too much in there, <laughs> it really overflows. Yeah, you, you, you understand. Well, when we look at leaven, one of, the, one of the things that we find is that leaven is actually a ferment. That is, it has the power to change the whole. And, and, and note, what fermentation is, is decomposition that brings about dissolution of unity. We will come back to this idea of unity later. But look at what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 6 to 7. He says, your glory is not good. Do you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are a leaven. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, leaven represents sin. Sin is a form of slavery, and, and, and the Passover is intended to deliver from faith of slavery. On, on, on the other hand, they told them to remove the leaven, but also eat unleavened bread, but take some bitter herbs. Well, the bitter herbs symbolizes sorrow or grief. I don't know whether you've ever eaten anything bitter. Have you eaten anything bitter? <laughs> and I mean, it, it, you, you, you're trying to get something else in your mouth real quick in order to get the better, bitter taste out of it. Well, when we go through grief and when we go through sorrow, we really do want to get over it and get over it as quickly as we possibly can. And, and so, so bitter herbs symbolize sorrow or grief for past sin or grief for the bitter oppression experienced in Egypt. Now, the lamb is the most important feature of the Passover meal. The lamb was supposed to be without blemish. For four days, the lamb was put to the test before being slain at twilight. He was to be roasted whole, and nor were any of his bones to be broken. In, 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 in verse of 46, it, it tells us, in the house, it shall be eaten. You shall not carry out any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. You are not supposed to break any of the bones of the lamb. The lamb is supposed to be intact. Why? Because this symbolizes unity. Unity where? Unity of the family. Unity, uh, but see, the family was supposed to eat the meal together. Everybody, every household was supposed to sit and eat that Passover meal together. But unity of the nation, because every household of Israel was supposed to eat it and participate in this event at the same time. And unity of God with his people. A long time ago, God told Abraham, he told it again to Isaac, and then he repeated it to Jacob that a great nation would be raised up out of their loins. However, without the blood of the lamb on the lamb post, uh, on the doorpost of their house, the slain of the lamb would have been in vain. On the night that the blood was applied, there was a great cry of anguish throughout the land of Egypt. But praise be to God that when the death angel saw the blood, he passed over that house. The blood on the doorposts of our temples it symbolizes open confession of our allegiance and love of Jesus. When, when we've got the blood and when we've been covered with the blood of Jesus, we can realize that, that God will pass over us and, and not uh, hold us uh, accountable to the extent that the wages of sin is death. Because that means that as sinful beings, we deserve to go to hell, but pray. 
symbolizes our confession of our allegiance and love of Jesus. And, and as Paul described, Christ was our sacrificial lamb and none of his bones were broken. Now in the book of Hebrews we find that we only needed our lamb to be slain once and for all. Our Passover lamb delivers us from the slavery of sin. Our bitter herbs are the bitter herbs of repentance and confession. The leaven of sin is now removed from our lives. Just like the Jews rejoice as they celebrated the Passover that God had delivered them from their enemies and just like they looked huh, with great expectation, the same um, jubilation uh, that they had of uh, looking forward to experiencing their future in the promised land. Uh, as God's chosen people, we too can experience the, the same uh, expectation because when we come to the communion table or uh, uh, when we come together, we are coming together uh, uh, to recognize and to remember what our Passover land did on the night before our Passover land was slain, slain at about the same time of the day Jesus held a Passover meal that was described in Exodus. However, Jesus moved us from Passover to communion that we may remember Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and he took the cup, signified that it was his blood. And we know that when the Lord sees the blood, the death angel passes over. Since the wages of sin is death, when we take the blood of Jesus by faith, the death angel passes over. And we can celebrate deliverance from the bondage of sin and deliverance from its wages. We can joyfully look forward to the day when Christ is coming back again. He told us to do this in remembrance of him. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death when he comes from Passover to communion. That's what he wants us to remember, that, that there is a song that states we don't have to slay the lamb anymore. We don't have to place the blood on the door. Why? Because Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. Jesus, who knew no sin, took all of our sins, took all of our sicknesses, took all of our diseases, nailed it to the cross. And, and, and now what we have is direct access to the Father that we can receive mercy for our souls. Thank God that Jesus took us from Passover to communion. And you know what? He did it once and for all. What do you mean he did it once and for all? Well, back in the day when the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies, he had to go into the Holy of Holies, not only for the people, but for himself. And if he happened to go into the Holy of Holies with sin in his life, they had a rope tied around his feet and, 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 and if the bells that he had on his robe, the, the bells on the robe were supposed to be ringing. And if they weren't ringing, and he went in with sin in his life, well, he would indeed immediately drop dead because the wages of sin is death. And death was immediate back then for the high priest. But praise be to God, when Jesus went to Calvary, he tore the veil of the temple in two so that we can indeed go boldly to the throne of grace. We can go to God ourselves, the high priest who has a, a, a sins of his own had the first to go for, for his sins and then for the sins of the people. But now because Jesus, being our high priest, went to the cross, paid the price for our sins, our sins are now forgiven by him as long as we got faith and trust and confidence in the work that he did on the cross. It was all sufficient. He took us from Passover to communion. And we praise God. 
for what he did, because that now gives us the privilege of knowing and understanding that it's the blood, the blood of Jesus. This is the blood that gives me strength from day to day shall not lose his power. This is all said, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day and will never lose this power. Oh, it reaches to the high Strength from there.